Leadership, purpose, service. This is Fulfilling the Dream with Wayman Brett. Your path to greatness is not simply paved with the grinding feet of persistence. Through motivating stories and personal testimonials, gain the insight you need to overcome life's biggest challenges and break through those barriers that hinder you. So when opportunity knocks at your door, you'll be ready. Welcome to Fulfilling the Dream. Well, we're so happy to have Lenny Wilkins, the infamous Lenny Wilkins, who uh, you will all get a chance to learn more about today, but he has been one of the greatest coaches of all time in the NBA. And uh, we had a chance to meet him a few years ago at an event in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm just so happy and thrilled to have you today, Lenny. And, uh, you know, let me just give you a little bit of background. I won't get into too much, but I'll share with you that Lenny has been inducted three times into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, first as a player in 1989 and as a coach in 1998. And in 2010, was a part of the 1992 United States Olympic Dream Team. And he was assistant coach. And then in 1996, uh, Lenny was named to the NBA 50th anniversary team. And, and in 2021, he was named to the 75th anniversary NBA team, the all-time great teams. And um, there's a whole lot more. Uh, I'm just thrilled with this story. His book uh, that I have read and have gone back through several times, uh, unguarded, uh, is just an amazing story. And uh, one that all of you should read. Uh, it is chock full of wisdom and valuable insight about how a person overcomes any obstacle in life, how determination and perseverance and uh, all of those attributes Lenny exemplified over his life. And uh, Lenny, I, I believe many dreams go unfulfilled for far too many in life, uh, from all walks of life. And after reading your book and studying your life, I would say that dreams, your dreams have been more than fulfilled. And we want our audience to discover just how and why this happened. And uh, our show is about creating an opportunity for people to be self-empowered so that they can solve problems in their lives and to overcome obstacles that uh, get in their path. And uh, we really want people to achieve their goals and dreams. And uh, I couldn't ask for a better person to be on our show today. And and uh, we're just happy to have you here. I have a few questions, but I wanted to just uh, welcome you and. Uh, Thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me and giving me this opportunity. You know, it's, uh, listen, I spent a lot of wonderful memories uh, in the Cleveland area. Uh, it, it was fun. We had great fans there. But uh, wherever we've gone, I, my wife and I, uh, we've been uh, well received. And, uh, and, yeah. and, and, you know, and I'm all about young people. I want them to know that uh, I want them to dream dreams. I want them to believe that they can make a difference. Uh, uh, yeah. All they need is an opportunity. They don't want anyone to give them something, but just an opportunity to achieve. And and I yeah think yeah that came through loud and clear when I met you. You know we were able to uh, travel uh, back and forth from the arena to the hotel there, and I just got a chance to see you and your son and how you all were interacting, the quiet demeanor and just the way that you interact with all of us. I mean, you treated us with so much respect and seeing Mark Price and Brad Daugherty and uh, others, how they interacted with you. They, has, they have so much respect for you. And I am I'm so thrilled that I had a chance to meet you. You've been one of the people that I've admired over the years. You like uh, Muhammad Ali and Arthur Ashe. Those people are the people that I looked to, to, uh, to grow my leadership ability. So, uh, so thank you so much. So, so Lenny, we're at a crossroads, I believe, as a nation. And, and, and my question to you first off is how do we create an environment for all, for all people, all young people to fulfill their dreams versus some? And I, that's kind of a loaded question, but um, I think uh, you, you might have some perspective on what's happening today and, and what maybe we need to do differently or do more of. Well, I, I think we have to engage with young people more. Uh, you know, we've got to let them know that they're the future. 
their tomorrows, doctors, lawyers, politicians. And yeah. uh, we need to encourage them to let them know that they can make a difference, okay? That uh, we've yeah. got to engage with them. Um, you know, you know I, as a youngster growing up, uh, my dad died when I was five. But yeah. uh, there were people in the neighborhood who engaged with us. Um, I got to know Jackie Robinson. You know, uh, he played wow. for the Brooklyn Dodgers and, and wow. they played Ebbets Field. And uh, Ebbets Field was just a bus ride or a train ride <laughs> away. <laughs> and, and the bleacher seats were 50 cents. So we used to go over there all the time to watch wow. him play. And I had the opportunity to meet him and to see wow. what, you know, what he went through. And he never made an excuse for himself, you know. Uh, he yeah. told me that they can never get in here, you know? Uh, wow. But that, it. you know, he, he played with fierceness. He played with intelligence. Uh, so yeah. that was one of my first role models, you know? And and certainly yeah. my mother was the other one because she yeah. wouldn't take no nonsense from us when we were growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah, I she she uh, definitely, I told you that that's one of the reasons I wanted to interview you because I, I really want to dial in on what your mom was like and what she gave you. You know, we all have mentors, important people, my dad, my mom and others, but it seemed like your mom and, and maybe the priest that you uh, had in high school, those are the people that kind of uh, mentored you and plotted you along in the right track. Maybe you want to open that up a little bit more and tell us a little more about your mom. Yeah, well, you know, it was difficult because she had to raise us by herself. She worked in a candy factory, you know, uh, and then at the same time, you know, she would always tell us that we, we had to be uh, accountable, you know. Yeah. We, we had to be proud of who you are. And, you know, uh, we didn't have a, a lot of things, but what we had, uh, we were happy with. Um, you know, so she was, she was tough lady. She wasn't going to let you off the hook. And I yeah. don't care where we were. I actually remember yeah. growing up in Brooklyn and we would, uh, go shopping sometimes, uh, uh, downtown Brooklyn, A&S, you know, and, uh, yeah. if we acted up, we'd get cuffed right there in the store. She didn't care who was there, but, wow, you know, she wasn't going to let us get away with it. And, and, yeah. and not, uh, I mean, it's, it, you learn discipline early on. Right. Um, this, this seemed like she never put up with any excuses. And your father, who had passed away, I believe, what, what age were you when your dad passed away, Lenny? Yeah, I was five. I was five. five. I wow. remember, you know, this nun was holding me because uh, she was at the funeral. Yeah, and, uh, and and at that time they held the wakes at your apartment where you lived. Yeah, uh, and wow. I remember this nun holding me and saying to me, "Well, you're the man in the family now," and and I'm looking at her like you know <laughs> I don't know what wow. she's talking about. But yeah, uh, you know at that age, uh, it was hard. But we uh, had uh, a priest friend because my mom was uh, what we call a daily communicator. She went to church every day. Every okay. day. I, wow. I'm never, you know, known anyone to do that. And yeah. uh, she went and uh, she would always, uh, so everybody knew her at the church yeah. we went to. And uh, she, uh, if I, if she didn't like who I was hanging out with or whatever, She'd asked this priest in the parish who, uh -huh. who was very friendly to all the young people there, but yeah. she asked him to uh, give me a heads up, you know? Uh huh. Yeah. She had some allies. Oh. <laughs> she right. had some allies. Right. Uh -huh. and, and he was the type of guy, well, we used to call him Iron Hands because when he oh, grabbed yeah. you by the shoulder, you couldn't get away. <laughs> and, uh, but. He used to always, you know, be encouraging, and he he had a phrase he used all the time, and it was, uh, you know, who promised you? Um, and and wow. I used to look at him, you know, yeah. like, well, what's he talking about? And then I began to understand that uh, no one 
can promise you that life is going to be easy or a cakewalk or whatever. Yeah. Well, that you have to be accountable. You know, you wow. can c- control what happens in your life. And and it made sense, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, I began to realize that, wow. uh, and, and I tell young people all the time, you got to see that, hey, if I can do it, you can do it. You know? Yeah. Uh, let, let's not make excuses for each other. Right. You looked at uh, you like the other athletes that uh, that came before you, and you saw in them the things that you could mimic. And you know the the priest, your mom, and others, of course. But then you identified other people in in your world, in the basketball world, that you looked up to, and that you you tried to pattern your life after them, which is what I did. I mean, I looked at people like Arthur Ashe, like I was telling you. And even Muhammad Ali, you know, as brash as he was, I'm not that brash as a person, but I picked up so much about his attitude about, you know, being confident in yourself and, uh, you know, just being proud of who you are and, and the hard work and the dedication that he brought to the table. And if we can just pick out some of those people in life, that's what you're talking about. Um, and, and, and we have so many role models. You know, you mentioned Arthur Ashe. I mean, Boy, yeah. I really followed tennis and became a uh, a good tennis player uh, on yeah. the, when I wasn't playing basketball. But Arthur Ashe uh, stood up uh, strong. Muhammad Ali, you know, right. Jack Robinson, you know, uh, uh, these were incredible people. But I yeah. began to meet other people as well, and and yeah. and so uh, you know, the thing is, is that. Uh, young people today need that kind of encouragement. You know, the, 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 yes, as they I said, do. You know, they they they're our future. They're the doctors, the lawyers, the politicians. You know, they sure. And and believe me, if you look, you you mm-hmm. can find your people. I you know I just had the opportunity a couple of two three weeks ago. I was mm-hmm. invited to a reception uh, up here in the state of Washington, and. Yep. Uh, and and who was there? Uh, I got to meet Hakeem Jeffries. And, oh wow! Uh, you know, and he's from Flatbush, and I'm from Bed Stuy. Uh, oh, he's from New York too. Oh wow! Yeah. And uh, you know, and I'm so proud of him. You know, I am too. <clears throat> I, and I told him he kicked it out of the park when he gave his address to Congress. I mean, he it sure, was unbelievable. And he so sure we did. do have people that can make a difference and. And I want young yeah. people to see that, to take a yeah. look because uh, our history is filled with people. You know, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, I want to mention uh, uh, there was a yeah. gal that mm-hmm. we used to see in the neighborhood all the time, uh, Shirley Chisholm. And, oh, uh, my gosh. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yes. And, uh, we, and we uh. would make sure when she walked down the street that she got the respect she was due. Oh my and God! So as young people, we saw that, and uh, yeah, but that because of my mom, because of Father Madia, because of Jackie Robinson, you know, I realized that yes, you can make a difference, but you yes. know, it's a two-way street, and if you want it, you have to give it, and and young people have to understand that as well. Yes, sir, and you know. We are sometimes our own worst enemy, aren't we? I think yeah. that what happens to a lot of us, we have these circumstances that have come along. You know, it could be some slight, somebody said something. You know, somebody um, you know tells you that maybe you're not going to be who you want to be in life. Or, you know, you have some tragic issue that happens in life. But you, that shouldn't hold us back, right? You, you, what, you've, what you talk about in your book is that these things are going to happen to us. And your job in life is not to let any of that stuff phase you. You recognize us there, you know, but don't ever let any of those circumstances keep you from fulfilling your dream. And could you talk about that? Because it's not easy out here uh, today with the various messages uh, that are happening. You know, the negativity that's in the world that keeps playing all the time. And that's what I try to shield myself from it and my kids and grandkids. But could you talk about that for a minute? Well, you know, it's something that we will always encounter. 
there's always somebody that's going to say something or not uh, be happy with who you are or may misread you, you know. And I've always said, if, if you don't like honesty, you don't like me. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you how it is. I mean, I'm going to be very upfront and honest with you. But yeah. I think that uh, the young people that I've always worked with, uh, they respected that. They understood yeah. that, that yeah. I had uh, their welfare is what I was looking out for. Because I yeah. want them to be able to achieve, to see that they could be right. successful. And right. through basketball, I've had the opportunity to travel the world. And uh, yeah. I uh, went to South Africa one time with the Kenby Mutombo and Wes wow. School and, uh, and I had a chance to meet Nelson Mandela. And, oh, wow. And I, we went and visited Robbins Island. And we saw where he was in prison for like 26 oh my God. years. I, you know, and, and I said, 26 years. Oh my God. You, you know, how could you not be bitter? And he said, because I knew my people oh. were waiting for me. They wanted. Oh my goodness. Yes. And I said, wow. Now that's heavy when you think about it. Yeah. You know? His people were waiting. So, so what he was saying is, is if, his bitterness would would hinder him from being present for that's the right. people that he wanted to serve, right? That's what you're saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. Wow. It. it takes you out of the game. That bitterness, that 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 uh, that negative thought pattern keeps you away from the very people that you really want to serve and that you want to help in life. That's what you're talking about. I have this picture on my wall over here with Martin Luther King and others and Gandhi and so forth. And I'm always reminded of these guys. I mean, they set the pace uh, tremendously. And, and, and man, that's why I wanted to have you on the show. You know, the, the people, you and John Wooten are the two guys that, that became, you know, basketball hall of famers as a player and as a coach. And I know Wooten has mentored uh, others like Kareem, Abdul Jabbar and Bill Walton. And then I know the guys that showed up at your hall of your wall of fame induction in Cleveland, Brad Daughtery and, and, and Price and others. Could you speak more about that? Because here's what Wooden said. He said, things work out best for those who make the best of how things work out. Right. It's kind of what you, you've been talking about. And what, what were the things that, the, the kernels of wisdom and mentoring knowledge that you might have shared with some of these athletes that have gone on. I mean, Brad Daughtery now, you know, he's co-owner of one of the NASCAR series teams. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's amazing what he's been able to do. Well, uh, the thing with young people and Brad and Mark and Larry Nance and Mike yeah. Sanders, all the guys uh, I had in Cleveland, and, and I would let them know that, uh, you know, uh, we have to find a way to give back, you know, yeah. and, but, but you got to secure yourself first. Mm. So if, if, you, if you have the confidence and if you believe mm. you can make a difference, then you're not going to mm. let little things set you back. If you mm. fall down, it, you, you get up. Uh, it, it's just a chance to start over again, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, you know, I, I realized through my mom, through people like Jackie Robinson and others, that uh, Father Mannion, that when you're in position, you want to be able to give back to your community. You want to make yeah. it better than it, it is. Uh, than wow. What you found. So wow. I've always felt that, okay, you know, how do we do that? You know, what attracts you? And uh, as a young player in uh, St. Louis, I worked with high school dropouts in the off season. I mean, ah. I worked for Stano Corporation also. Uh, oh wow! To business, you know, I wanted to learn all about uh, corporate type stuff, and yeah. then then I started to work with high school dropouts in Cleveland. I worked with an organization called Shoes for Kids. And uh, in the holidays, we had a big dinner, and we'd make sure that we'd invite a lot of uh, needy young people and yeah. we'd present gifts to them. Uh, and then when I came to Seattle, yeah. uh, 
I was uh, kind of adopted by these two women that uh, were very active in the community. One, yeah. was, her name was Freddie Mae Gautier, and the other was mm -hmm. Tony Burton. And they sort yeah. of adopted me and my wife, okay? Uh, they worked with a clinic in uh, Seattle. It was called the Odessa oh, yeah. Children's Clinic. Yeah. And it provided health care and education to families, irregardless of their ability to pay. Because, you know, a lot of people didn't have health care. Yeah. And so the Odessa Brown uh, in Seattle became my charity. I mean, I uh, got, I started to have, uh, I had a little tennis tournament at first, but then yeah. I went into a golf tournament because it could be bigger. Yeah. And then uh, we had, my wife said we should add a dinner to it. And so we've raised millions of dollars over the years for the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. Yeah. And the clinic serves, it, no matter what your background is, uh, they serve, uh, you know, minority, whether it be Native American, whether it be African American, whether, yeah, whatever. Whatever. And, uh, you get the care there. And the wow. clinic has grown over the years. We had a wonderful, uh, the, the first medical director was a gal named Blanche Lavizio. And when she awesome. left, uh, a young uh, African American, uh, guy by the name of uh, Ben Danielson uh, okay. became the, the medical director and for years, you know, yeah. and the clinic has grown and we uh, not only have the original, but it's, uh, we have the, the new place which opened and I mean, we built it, it was built and it opened up a couple of years ago okay. and it can handle many, many more. Um, awesome. And it provides the health care for uh, people in the uh, Seattle area. Awesome. You know, you've answered one of the questions I had on my list. What would you want your family, your children, your community to see about you and as you enter in this phase, you know, the retirement phase that you've been in for a while, of course, after leaving the NBA? And what would you want to know? What would you want people to know? And I think you've answered that question. It sounds like to me, you're saying is, if you can give back in the community in a, in a special way, if you're in a position to do that, do that. Find a way to share your wealth, ser serve your t uh, share your talents with the with with the rest of the world, and um, you know, a lot of us sometimes are always looking at what you know people can do for us, and and um, I struggle with that because I I agree with you. You want to make sure you are set right yeah. as you as you've left your career, and I've left my career, the county of Kent, for instance. But you want to make sure that you're tapping into some of those resources, the the knowledge, the well, the material resources that you have, in fact, and you want to share that back with community. And that's really what I believe I've been asked to do. And I, and I'm, and I applaud you for what you've done. It's tremendous. I can't uh, thank you enough for, for sharing that because it affirms what I'm about. You know, Fulfilling the Dream, we've started a Celebrity Open here, uh, much like you, a golf outing, and we're sharing those dollars back to young people, uh, organizations that are working with young people to develop their leadership and their ability to be resilient and so on and so forth in our community. So I, I'm so thankful for that. So, you know, on page 17 of your book, you mentioned the fact that you were born in 1937. Now that's, that's a while ago at the end of the depression. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not so long because I was born in 1954, so you know, yeah. not too far after you. Yeah. But it was an era of where you know we you did you had to get on with life, and and uh, you talk about the fact that it was an era when people had to had the luxury to become caught up in in introspection. You couldn't afford to be caught up in introspection, and over and over and over again, it was drilled into you: don't feel sorry for yourself and so forth, and that too many people are captives of their past and have jailed their hearts with bitterness and regrets. Could you expound on that a little bit? Because I want our listeners to, to get that, because I think sometimes we get a little bit downer in our dauber, as Coach Orr used to tell me at Michigan. Talk about that for a minute, what that means. Expound on that. Well, you know, the thing is, is that uh, 
like I've said many times, you know, uh, you can't feel sorry for yourself, okay? I mean, you, you've you got to learn that if you fall down, you get up yeah. and you move on, okay? Right. And, uh, and, 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 and I had opportunity to see this uh, as a youngster, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. When I saw Jackie Robinson, um, you know, I, I went to Ebbets Field. I saw him steal home plate from third mm -hmm. base, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I saw, I, I know what he went through. Uh, I remember uh, it didn't happen in Brooklyn, but I forget where it happened, but it was in the papers. Uh, so they threw a black cat out on the field or something. Oh, you know? wow. Um, uh, early on, uh, guys would slide into second base and try to spike him you know, and everything. But uh, he was above all that, okay? Wow. I mean, he was fierce because when he went from <laughs> third place to home plate, he was going to run you over, all right? But uh, it was he played, with, like I said, with fierceness, but also with intelligence. And yeah. in Ron, if you know anything about Jackie, you know, uh, he had a good college career, and yes. he also went to work for Chuck Full of Nuts. I remember that it was a big coffee company, and oh uh, yeah, and 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 so he was always making a difference. You know, he was letting people know that he was around, and, yeah. uh, and I admired that about him. Uh, wow. but, you know, and 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 so uh, I looked up to people. There was a guy in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, yeah. When uh, I played baseball first, and then I started to get into basketball. And mm -hmm. I remember going to uh, out for the high school team because Tommy Davis wanted me to. And Tommy yeah. grew up in my neighborhood, and he was a heck of an athlete. And Tommy was baseball, basketball, he could, whatever he wanted, he could play. But right. He, uh, Tommy uh, got me to come out for the high school team. And I went out for the high school team, and there were 15 guys on the team. I was number fifteen, okay, huh. and huh. Uh, and I didn't get to play much, so I had to drop off because uh, I w I had a little job on the side to help the family a little bit, yeah. and uh, so I started going to the playground a lot, and uh, and I remember this one Saturday during my junior year, uh, they were letting me play in the full court game. And huh. in the game, a lot of college players used to come down and play, you know, it was during the summer. Yeah. This one Saturday, I'm guarding a guy named Vinnie Cohen, who went to Syracuse University, was all American and everything. And yeah. he lived right around the corner from me. And uh, I block his shot, I steal the ball, you know, <laughs> I score on him. And but yeah. you know how fans are out there. They yeah. were, they were, you know, this edging everybody on, and yeah, uh, him a bit. Vinny got upset and ran me into a pole. You know, oh. and I got his attention. So, but afterward, he said to me, "Don't you ever quit?" You know, ah. and, he, and and I know when I say the name Vinny Cohen, a lot of people thought he was Jewish. He wasn't. He he was he an wasn't. African. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And and just you know, but he encouraged me to continue on, and yeah. and Tommy always did also. So uh, my senior year, I went out for the high school team. I I got skipped halfway, so I graduated in the mid year. But I became a starter. Huh. And this was this you had you hadn't been playing like the first two or three years, right? You, you, right. you, you right. Wow. Just and you became a starter your your fourth year, right? Yeah, right. Just wow. on the playground, and and I played uh, uh, with the CYO a little bit, you know. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, uh, I was very fortunate, and this priest friend of mine, Father Manuel, wrote to Providence College, and said that they should take a look. Yeah. At, you know, at me as a as a chance for a scholarship. So Absolutely. the coach came down. When he came down to, to New York for the PSAL championship, yeah. I wasn't playing. I had already graduated. 
And uh, he gave me a brochure. I filled it out, mailed it in, and I never heard from them. Uh Well, that summer, uh, I was eligible to play in the high school tournaments. Okay. And I played in this one, who was the Flushing YMCA tournament, with some guys I knew who I had, you know, started to play with on the playgrounds. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, I played it with them, and uh, we won the tournament, and I got the MVP of the tournament. <laughs> and then there was a guy at the game who uh, was uh, the coach of Providence's father. And so he called his son, Joe Mullaney, and said, this can't be the same kid that wants to go to Providence, you know? <laughs> and he said, no, I, they called me. I was accepted. Oh, I got a full board scholarship, which I needed because there's no way yeah. I could draw it. Yeah. And, uh, and we uh, went to Providence College, and there it started. You know, we wow. had a freshman team. Because back then, you had to play freshman ball. Yeah, and um, our freshman team was we were twenty three and old that year. Oh wow, <laughs> unbelievable! Way to go, man! See, yeah, that that's something that we do have in common. We were twenty four and old, twenty two and old my senior year in high school. But um, we, you know, it, it's it's just amazing how your story tells you that no matter where you start, it's it's not matter where you start, but it's about where you finish. You know, if you have that heart and determination. And uh, believe in your dreams. Things can happen to you. You know, you could have easily said, oh, well, you know, I'm not, you know, thought of that greatly. I don't need to put forth any effort. But something, something triggered you to keep that going, keep that dream alive. And boy, we need to make sure that we share that with people. Wow. So I believe that you've, you've actually made more in terms of your your career your knowledge that you've gained in your book i mean i think that's even more important than even your career from my perspective and this book this book called unguarded my 40 years surviving the nba is what people should read they get a lot out of that because i feel i feel that right now what's happening in the world today lenny too often as we get sidetracked on the negative and your book really helps to guard, guard against that. And I feel that the, what the world needs now to hear more about how you, you know, recognize the bad things that are happening, but at the same time, you can't let any of that stuff interfere and get your goat and, and, and cause you to fracture. I mean, I, I see some of that happening even, even in the NBA sometimes now where guys you know, get a little bit upset and they get these technical files for for dumb reasons, I think that we can all get uh, get off the path. And uh, for some reason, you've main- you maintain that ability to, to keep that composure. You know, you're cool, you're calm. And where does that come from? How do we attract that into our lives? And wh- what do we do to prepare ourselves so that we're more stable and uh, I would guess more even keeled, if you will. How? Because that's that's you. That's that's the person that I've always seen. I never saw you getting upset as a coach out on the floor. You always maintain that poise. And so, tell us about that, and, and maybe help some of us to to uh, bear up on that. What do you do? How do you do that? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, the thing I say to people is that it if you want to make a difference, okay. You got to be in control. I mean, if, if if I'm out of control, then everything around me is going to be out of control. Wow! And 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 I feel that's really important. And and the people over the years that I've met, uh, Nasa Mandela was not out of control, and his life was being threatened all the time. All okay? the time. Wow! And so uh, this priest friend in my parish. You know, he didn't have a lot to work with, but uh, Sunday nights uh, was the gym was open to the kids, and they had basketball game, and they had yeah. music and dancing and stuff. You know, and he right. had a, it was a place for young people to go. Yeah, you know, uh, wow. the PAL it was a place for young people to go. 
uh, the boys club. Uh, it was yeah. at one time it was called the boys welcome hall. Right. And, uh, and I never could afford to go, but they would let me in free. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. Well, they knew the family, the neighborhood and everything. But so I saw people and, and, and I realized that, uh, you don't scare people away. Uh, you got to be able to communicate. You got to be able to talk. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I felt that was so important. Uh, you know, there was, uh, my mother used to watch a program on TV. We, we didn't mm -hmm. get a TV until my junior year in high school. Wow. We finally got a TV, but, <laughs> and by then I wasn't interested, but, uh, because I was always interested in going out to the boys club or the PAL or whatever. Yeah. Um, but her and my sisters used to watch a program on every Sunday. It was Bishop Fulton Sheen and he would talk and he had sort of a calming influence on people. Uh, Many years later, I met him in person uh, huh. and, and I had, I was just married and, we were back visiting Brooklyn, and I was visiting Father Mannion, and he was there. And Father Mannion introduced him to me, right? Oh, me to him, and and I was so impressed, you know. And and so, you know, it's like hmm. saying, if you can do it, I can do it. And and yeah. and I have to tell you one thing that I I skipped over, uh, my. Uh, I had never been to a pro basketball game. I'd been to baseball games, but not never basketball. Huh. And my senior year, I was drafted by the St. Louis Hawks. Yeah. And I, they invited me out. I never went out there because I thought I was going to go on to get a teaching degree. So I didn't yeah. go. And, and huh. also, when we, my junior year, we played in St. Louis. Uh, and, uh, and I remember you couldn't eat in the restaurants in downtown St. Louis. Yeah. That wasn't, uh, them drafting me wasn't, I didn't, I think that great for me. Yeah. What my senior year, uh, they sent a scout up to talk to me because they had drafted me. And, uh, one of the guys on my school team was from Boston. And the Celtics uh -huh. were playing the Hawks for the championship, basketball, NBA championship. And he wanted to go to the game. So he said he said to me, see if we can get tickets to the game. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. So I asked the, the scout. So he said, yeah, yeah, he'll get us to the game. So we went. And here's a team that drafted me, and I'll watch it. And uh, the Celtics beat them. But. Sitting there, I said to myself, watching them play, I can do that. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, I know it's brash, but I said I can do no. that. And that's why that's I decided I would go try uh, out for the Hawks. Wow. And, uh, and, 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 and from that point on, you know, it was always, yeah. You know, I knew I, I, could, I could read the floor. I could see right. what was going on, you know. Yeah. And it made a huge difference. Yeah, you transitioned to a player coach and, you know, all along, uh, you know, your book talked about this a little bit too, about how, you know, your your ability to see the game and your ability to, you know, motivate the players, you know, as a as a as a, as a captain of a team or a key player of the team all transition you well into the coaching arena. Which is which is really wonderful, you know, to be able to take those skills or those those abilities that you you had, and then turn those around into helping other guys be successful. And uh, I understand that you didn't want to do the coaching thing initially, right? You had to be uh, they, uh, kind of they, yeah. I had uh, we were it was funny because I was traded to Seattle, yeah, and it was we, you know it was a contract thing. The, the Hawks were sold to Atlanta. And uh, I was old. I was a free agent, um, and uh, we we couldn't agree on a contract. But also, the coach and I had bumped heads a little bit my last year in St. Louis, and uh, so uh, when uh, they sold the franchise, 
they didn't invite me to the di- the luncheon they had for the team. But okay. I knew. I knew. I mean, I saw the handwriting on the wall. I knew I was going to be traded. And I was uh, traded to uh, uh, Seattle. Yeah. So when I came, uh, I was uh, a player on the team. I was there one year and then let the coach go. And the uh, general manager talked to me about being a player coach. And I yeah. told him, I said, you got to be crazy. I said, <laughs> no. He said, well, you run the team anyway, you know. And uh, it was so close to training camp that I decided, okay, I'll try it. Yeah. And uh, and the players were very respectful. I mean, I knew how to run a practice because yeah. I had done it before. Right. Like, it's with the – uh, the Hawks, if the coach had a problem or whatever, I he ran. You stepped in. Yeah. Wow. I would step in. So, yeah. so I knew the game. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, I, uh, I, I, w- I knew that preparation was something that would be mm-hmm. required. And I would make sure that I was always prepared and ready. Yes. So that, uh, we had organized practices. We knew what we wanted to cover. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then uh, also uh, I asked, I hadn't gotten to know the coach at UW. His name was Marv Harshman. Okay. And, and so I asked him one time to come over and watch my practice to see if I was covering everything. <laughs> and it was funny. <laughs> he did. He was a good guy. And, uh, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I uh, you know it's uh, you. Uh, it's amazing. It's it's amazing what how your career goes in different directions. Yes, yes, yes. You were set up for that all along. Back when your mom and and the, the priests were kind of uh, yeah. mentoring you and coaching you and and so forth. And then later on, you know, it shows up as 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 you being the coach. I mean, you coach. Not only were you the assistant coach, but you became the head coach of the. The the nineteen I think it was a nineteen ninety six or ninety seven team that went uh, that that won the Olympic gold as well, so it's not ninety six yeah. yeah so so yeah. so those two things I mean how was it like interacting with those guys I mean you know these 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 athletes Michael Jordan and Magic it, Bird it was, and those guys yeah it was great I mean you know uh, I mean coaching was something that I really understood and I knew and I I thought I was good at it. I knew what to cover, what not to cover, not waste my time on, things yeah. like that. So that's a part of preparation. But uh you're right. I um uh, you know, e- even as a youngster, I remember Father Mannion had me coach this girls team in our parish. And uh well wow. And and I didn't know if he was doing that to keep me occupied or, or what, you know, make sure I stayed out of trouble or what. But uh, it was fun, you know, and we had some good players. And uh, but it, I, I guess it did carry over. And uh, yeah. so when I got into coaching, you know, even as a player coach, I knew that I had to get rest. I knew that I had to take myself out at certain times. Yeah. What not, and I would tell. Uh, the guy who I made my assistant to watch out for those things. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think I could have probably played longer, but I, we were starting to get young players into the league who, uh, you know, hadn't uh, played much college ball. They had played one year or maybe yeah. two. And yeah. uh, there, there was so much teaching that had to go on. So yeah. that's when I retired in 75. Uh, I think I could have played a few more years, but yeah, because you were I, in great shape. Yeah, yeah. I decided that uh, okay, hey, let me let me focus on this because I think I could be good at it. Yeah, well, you did a, you did one hell of a job, Coach. I mean, I'm just uh, amazed uh, that that your career, just how you were over, able to overcome all of that stuff that was going on back in the day, and then still you know, reach that height and be successful so long, as long as you were, you know, the, become the winningest coach in NBA history. And um, that's just amazing. And what a testimony Moni, to your ability and your, 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 your talent and, and, and all that you, you bring to the table. 
And, um, you know, we're getting closer to the end of our uh, time here today, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak to anything you want to speak to. I know that the NBA uh, championships are going on right now, and uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the one team that uh, is aspiring to become uh, the Western champions, uh, I believe Sacramento, and, and uh, they're up against uh, one phenomenal foe. I don't know, who do you, who do you, who do you think is going to win it all? And tell me what you think about the NBA season and what's going on right now. Well, um, this season was interesting, and I had a chance to watch a lot. And uh, uh, they don't play defense the way we used to. Uh, I agree. Me, I would teach it. Uh, yeah. Because I watch uh, defense against screen and roll isn't very good. Uh, yeah. They don't want to rotate how to help recover, stuff like that. And we practiced that stuff. We worked yeah. on it. And I think that uh, yeah. we got great talent in the league. Make no yeah. mistake about that. There's great yeah. talent in the league. But I think yeah. that uh, scoring has kind of taken over that everybody wants to score. Yes. Everybody wants I do to too. Wherever. Yeah. So uh, any team that has an in-between game is going to be successful. And that's why you <laughs> Sacramento all of a sudden come out of nowhere. Well, yes. they didn't come nowhere. I watched them during the year, and yeah. they helped in between stuff. I think that Mike Brown has done a incredible job. You know, yes, uh, sir. I, I really do, and uh, and I would like to see him win it. I really would. Uh, you know, yeah. it's gonna be yeah. tough. It's but gonna be tough. Have, they have a chance. You know, yeah. they. Uh, I think. Uh, I thought Milwaukee earlier, but Milwaukee, uh, you know, I love Giannis. I think he's a great player, but yeah. I, you don't want him bringing the ball up all the time. No, you that's know? that's interesting how we allow the big guys today to bring the ball up. I see it yeah. happening all the time. We never used to see that. It was always the guard or the off guard yeah. and bring the ball up. But the difference between Giannis and uh, Jokic, Jokic. He, he he makes the play. He's reading the floor. See, yeah. he sees the open guy and right. gets him the ball right now. now right, right. See, where uh, Milwaukee, uh, I, I just feel bad for them because I was kind of rooting for them earlier. But yeah. I think too many mistakes, too many turnovers. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, and their court awareness isn't real great. Uh, right. All these things are important if you want to affect the game yeah and, uh and i would you know so but uh sacramento they got a chance i i would like to see it you know uh i think that uh uh phoenix has played phoenix. well yes. you know uh i've always been a chris paul fan I yeah known me too many years and yeah chris is the man job and and then of course they add a player like Durant to their team Oh, they've got a killer yeah. team, don't they? Yeah. So, so oh, I'm enjoying watching the playoffs. I, I, I don't root for any one team. I just want to see good basketball. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's a great time of year. I mean, it's really spectacular to see them playing the way they're playing. I mean, these yeah. games that are going into overtime, and you know, yeah. my Miami the other day. Oh my gosh, that was one hell of a game. Yes. Jimmy Butler put in. You know, yeah. defensively and offensively too. You know, and I know that both of those are, are your trademarks: defense and offense too. And yeah. whenever we see teams that can play that way, then then it really makes me excited because I think, uh, you know, it just it just shows you to win championships, you got to play that defense too, right? Yes, you will. Yeah, no question about it. Yeah. So, man, I am so thrilled and happy that you were able to come on, and I hope we were able to catch everything that we 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 heard from you today, and that we can get a good recording out there. We'll punch it back to you, of course. Uh, make sure that you're you get a chance to to hear it yourself. And uh, I want to thank uh, all the listeners that are out there that tuned in uh, to our show today, and. Look forward to the next time when we have another awesome guest like Lenny Wilkins. I don't think anybody can beat you, though, Coach. I think you're going to be the best of all times, <laughs> like you were in the NBA. You're, you're being very gracious, and I appreciate no, it. <laughs> no, man, I'm telling you, you class act, and uh, we all want to follow uh, follow your footsteps, man. You led the way. And so I want to thank you again for coming on today, for fulfilling the dream. 
and uh, look forward to making all dreams come true. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening to Fulfilling the Dream with Wayman Britt, the podcast that gives you courage and confidence to fulfill your dreams. Discover the riveting personal account of Wayman's journey in his book, Fulfilling the Dream, My Path to Leadership and Finding Purpose Through Serving Others, available in print and audiobook. If you haven't done it yet, subscribe to Fulfilling the Dream, wherever you get your podcast. Share this episode with others. If you think you don't know them well enough, do it anyway. Be bold. Make a connection. And if you have a powerful story to tell, let us hear it. To get connected, visit fulfillingthedreampodcast.com. <laughs>